I found myself in the city there for three weeks on my own. And like many writers and literary heroines, of course, the city changed my life. For me, it was about the literal history as much as the art or the wine or the men or even the pasta. The more time I spent on the streets, the braver I got. The more I threw away my guidebook, the more I found, and the more I got lost, to continue the metaphor, the more I actually started to find something, which was the incredible, deep, rich rock strata of history that still exists in that city. And I found myself asking myself a question, which in a sense I hadn't done for many, many years, since being a terrified history undergraduate with Jill Sutherland as my director of studies, (laughs) which is, what the hell happened here 550 years ago to make this small provincial city in Italy the beginning of a cauldron of a cultural revolution, the like of which probably Western Europe has never experienced since. So how exactly did this collision of economy, political stability, patronage, intellectual revival, art, religion, or whatever, actually meld together? And more importantly, I started to ask myself, and what would it have been like to be living in it while it was happening, i.e. for it to be the shock of the new, for it to be a kind of red-hot modernity around you as opposed to a place in the history books. And wouldn't it be amazing if one could write a novel that recaptured that feeling of vibrating excitement and change? Wouldn't it be fantastic to write a novel? Yes, how, of course, does one do it? But we'll go on to that in a moment. Um, the good news, of course, is that much of my work was done for me because the history was both bountiful and colourful. And I, I mean that quite literally, because much of it was actually on the walls around me. And, of course, part of the revolution that I wanted to write about was the one that had taken place in art. Because this was the moment, as you will all very well know, when those kind of all sweet, anatomically challenged pictures of Mary holding a sort of two-dimensional baby Christ with loads of saints next to her gives way through the discovery of perspective to bodies which actually feel like they are made of flesh and blood. And at the same moment, the emergence of platonic philosophy and the growth of humanism means that man, who is once so small and insignificant in all of those pictures, because all, of course, of the art is religious, suddenly starts to step up and get a little taller next to God, right? So you go into any church of this period, and I spend my life in them, right? And the walls are suddenly alive with what it feels like real people. So Christ may have lived and died in Galilee, but his life now takes place in Tuscany. The cities he lives in are all Renaissance cities. The setting and the clothing are modern and contemporary to the moment. And the men on the streets, the extras in the religious stories, if you like, have become unreal and vital as the stars of the show. These men and women, but especially men, populate Florence in almost any building or church that you will go into. And although they all appear in what will be the life of John the Baptist or the life of somebody else, what you find is that your eye, your eye is going to them rather than anyone else. And the level of detail, the level of social observation is extraordinary. This is actually from the Medici Chapel. And the man on the left is probably a portrait of a Negro slave. There were Negro slaves in Florence at that time, very little known fact. Florence and the Renaissance actually flourished on uh, domestic work which came from slavery. And that guy on the right is actually the painter, Benozzo Gonzoli, right? He's part, if I go back, you'll see him here, right? I could pick out a million of these images, and if you know Florence well, you'll remember them yourself. But this is perhaps one of my favourite because it comes from a chapel that I'm very, very fond of, which is the Maggiore Cappella in Santa Maria Novella by Girandayu. And I think what I thought when I saw these figures is that is a novel in itself. Those four men's faces with their age, their thinking, their life behind them, every single wrinkle, every gesture is about their characters. And it really is enough to get the novelist's imaginative juices going. 
And it's particularly wonderful because it's the first time in history when you feel like you're looking at the faces as they actually existed, as a way of penetrating into the past. In fact, sometimes they are so powerful, these extras, that they actually crowd out the main action, right? This is Botticelli's Adoration of the Magi. You probably know it well. And there, indeed, is uh, the Madonna. Let's see if I can do this, yes. With the baby Jesus. How small are they, right? <laughs> Look at all of these guys, though. They're actually the main drama, right? Look to your left and look to your right. <laughs> this is Lorenzo de' Medici. You can never mistake him. Look at that jaw, <laughs> right? And that is Botticelli himself. Now, all of this, of course, is immensely rich fodder for a novelist because what these figures tell you is they tell you as much as any book about how that culture is changing during this moment. Through these and hundreds of other faces, you can smell, almost touch, the character of Florence in the 1480s. The set of the jaw, the cut of the cloth, the confidence in their step. The way, if you like, you really can see man standing up a bit taller next to God. So that was the good news for me as a novelist. The bad news is that I didn't want to write just about men. I also wanted to write about women. And the reason I wanted to write about women was, and this is so interesting in terms of how creativity comes together, something happened in my own private life around this time to direct me to this. So I had been in Florence for three weeks on my own, right? On the fourth week of my sojourn there, my two daughters, who'd been on holiday with their dad, came out to visit me. They were, at the time, 10 and 13 years old. By the time they arrived, I, of course, knew more or less everything there was to know about the Italian Renaissance, and I thought it would be a really good idea if they knew it too. <laughs> so, the four, first morning out on the streets, I said to both of them, well, today we are going to go around this city and I'm going to take you to churches and art galleries and museums and you are going to learn what happened here 500 years ago to make this the cauldron of the greatest... Blah, 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 blah. And my 13-year-old, who was, as defines a 13-year-old, attitude on a stick, turned to me and said words which are now legendary in our house, which is, I think you should know, Mum, that at this time in my life I don't do culture, I just do shopping. <laughs> And the 10-year-old, whose job it was absolutely to get up the nose of the 13-year-old, turned to me and said, oh, that sounds really interesting, Mum, I'll come with you. <laughs> so I'm walking through the streets of Florence with these two deeply obstreperous, troublesome, but rather extraordinary young women on either arm, and I suddenly realise that I have one hell of a hard sell in front of me. Because everything I'm going to show them and every name I am going to give them will be that of a man. Every artist, every thinker, every architect, every political person, every philosopher, everybody whom we think of as being central to this explosive moment of Western culture is male. And I started to think, <laughs> did women have a renaissance? What was it like? to be half of the population during this extraordinary moment. And what would it have been like to be more than just half of the population, but to have some talent here? My younger daughter at the time had really rather a good ability to paint. She was one of those children who saw a chair, and when she put four lines on a paper, it looked like a chair, as opposed to the four lines when I put on a paper, right? And I started to think, so if God was dealing out genius at this time, and there is one hell of a lot of men's names there, why didn't it go to the women? What was it that meant that women could not make their mark artistically in this city? Of course, it's a very old question. Why are there no more female Beethovens, etc.? And there is, of course, a very good answers to it. We could do an hour on that alone. But what it did was it, it, it kick-started me into an idea. History had thrown up a few names. Uccello has a daughter who works in his studio for a while, but at 16 she's shoved into a convent. There's a nun called Petilla who does a little bit of work. And of course, Artemisa Gentileschi, who I think gives Caravaggio a run for his money, emerges, but she's a century and a half later. So what I really wanted to know is, what would it have been like to be a young woman born at this moment, born into a good family, well-educated, because women were getting good humanist Renaissance educations by this time, who was born with the power to draw, with a natural talent. What would she do and how could she not get her hands on the wall? And it was in that moment that the idea behind the birth of Venus was born. 
So what I needed, of course, was some images of women to kind of get my imaginative juices going. And of course, there are images of women in the Renaissance. You know, some of the greatest artists are capturing them. These are two of Leonardo's earliest lovely ladies, portraits completely. And they are absolutely lovely. Except that was also partly my problem. I was out looking for character, and instead I was meeting a kind of dreamy, coy beauty. And that, of course, is history too. Decent, well-bred women were meant to look lovely and dreamy and modest. Unlike the men, they didn't, they couldn't look at you. That is indeed why Mona Lisa is such a famous painting at this moment, because she does appear to engage with your eyes. Again, you blame history. That female modesty you're looking at is backed up by a whole structure of thought about women. And it's nowhere more powerful than in art, whose driving force up until now has, of course, been religious. <coughs> so Mary, even when she has human flesh and blood's perspective, stays, well, perfect. This is Fra Lippi. Fra Lippi actually knew this woman, knew her in all senses of the word, actually. He was a monk, she was a nun, he ran off with her, right? <laughs> Yet on the canvas, she remains divine, unapproachable, and perfect, while the angel has bags of character, right? <laughs> and indeed, when Lippi hands on to his protege, no less than Botticelli, exactly the same thing happens. Even when classical mythology starts to nudge its way in, the most powerful figures still remain beautiful, dreamy, thin, wonderful, almost unapproachable. That is Botticelli's Venus. He uses the same uh, model again and again. She is perfect. She is modest. She does not actually resonate with complexity and character. And that was what I was looking for. It is interesting, actually, that when we come to flesh out history, when we come to tease it away from that grand narrative of kings and queens and battles and empires to those who lived on the margins, especially the lives of ordinary women, as many scholars have been doing over the last 30 years, and we'll talk about that in a moment, we have not been that helped by art because it actually hasn't, in any realistic way, properly represented them. Now, obviously, the problem is there are no women holding the paintbrush. But it's also, of course, because men are calling the shots and are putting the emphasis on beauty. And ironically, that's never more true than this moment in the Renaissance, because Platonic thought is being rediscovered as a philosophic thought, and with it comes the notion of the Platonic ideal. And when it comes to the physical appearance, what the Platonic ideal is saying, that beauty on the outside reflects beauty on the inside, right? Interestingly, men aren't a slave to this tyranny. Think of Lorenzo's jewel, all right? And I'll show you some other stuff in a minute. But actually, when it comes to women, their beauty is almost more important than their character. But there are women there to be found. You just have to look for them. And I found two in Florence that were quietly revelationary. The first was in the Brancacci Chapel in the Carmini Convent, where a young man, barely in his 20s, called Masaccio, in the 1420s paints a series of frescoes and in one of them I found this. <coughs> she is just one of those extras. But look at her. This is a woman on the streets, a woman about her business. She's not lovely, she's not young, but she's strong. And there's an incredible sense of motherhood about her. Not as some wondrous semi-religious experience, but just an everyday chore taking the kid out on the streets with her while she goes shopping. Not to mention the utter irresistibility of the sensuality <laughs> of that little bottom. <laughs> I don't want to go on about it because paedophilia is such a problem these days. <laughs> but certainly my relationship to my children when they were young had a lot to do with the beauty of that flesh. <laughs> right. 